Welcome to this section of the course. This is all about various methods for computing synchronization between two different electrodes or two different brain regions. And the idea is that these statistical measures of synchronization reflect something about brain connectivity. In other words, functional interactions between distinct neural populations. So before getting into any of the actual methods and before getting into the details, what I want to do in this video and also in the next video is give some general points of consideration. These are things to keep in mind whenever you are doing connectivity analyses, particularly with electrophysiology data, although some of these points also apply to other kinds of data, imaging data, for example. Okay, so the first point is, so these are the four points that I'm going to discuss. The first is bivariate versus multivariate interactions. So what do these terms mean? Well, bivariate refers to connectivity measures between two electrodes. So you're just considering a pair of electrodes at a time, whereas multivariate refers to a multitude of electrodes at the same time. So here we have a pretty cool little brain diagram picture thing. And the thing is, in, the, in an actual brain, there's tons of interactions. There's causal interactions, there's univariate and, and bivariate, multivariate interactions. It's a really, really complicated, rich network of interactions. However, when we do data analyses to look at connectivity, we generally ignore this rich multivariate structure, and instead we focus on bivariate measures. So that is to say, although we assume that the brain, the interactions in the brain look like this, with our data, we tend to do something like this. So we are ignoring like n minus two nodes in this network. Now that is not bad on its own per se, and multivariate networks are really difficult to analyze, let alone conceptualize. But it is important to realize that there are some limitations of limiting yourself to bivariate statistical measures in a multivariate network. One of those limitations, for example, is that there could be dynamics that explain away this connection, which we are missing because we're not measuring all these other connections. Another limitation is that this connection might be difficult to interpret without understanding the state of the rest of the network. Nonetheless, bivariate measures of connectivity are not inherently bad. They're not inherently wrong or misguided. It's just important to keep in mind that this is a really watered down view of what's actually happening in the brain. Now there are practical reasons to prefer bivariate measures. For example, the measures themselves, the statistical measures for bivariate interactions tend to be more robust. For example, more robust to noise, more statistically well characterized and well behaved compared to multivariate measures. And multivariate measures, well, we, we actually don't have a really great store of multivariate methods for brain connectivity. And the multivariate methods that we do have in the literature, which I'm not really going to talk about in this section a little bit, I will talk a little bit about graph theory towards the end. But these multivariate measures tend to be a little bit vague and sometimes difficult to interpret and very kind of high level where the conclusion ends up just being that there is more or less connectivity in some condition or some group of individuals. Okay, so again, multivariate is how things are really in the brain. Bivariate is how we tend to analyze our data. That's not wrong per se, but it is important to keep in mind that this is relatively impoverished. Okay, now we get to another source of data analysis concerns and a potential confound for connectivity analyses in uh, electrophysiology data, and that is something called volume conduction. So what is volume conduction? Volume conduction refers to the fact that electrical waves, electrical potentials can travel through so they can conduct through biological tissues due to the conductivity of those tissues, in particular, for example, all the water content that is in these various tissue types. So the electrical waves and magnetic waves are conducting through volumes, and that's what volume conduction refers to. Now, volume conduction is a bit of a double-edged sword. If we didn't have volume conduction, if we lived in a universe that was like exactly like our own universe, except that volume conduction didn't exist, 
Well, first of all, I guess the whole universe as we know it wouldn't exist if volume conduction didn't exist. But let's pretend for a moment that volume conduction didn't exist. Or maybe we can pretend that the brain were encased in a rubber sheath that was totally electrically isolated. Now, that would mean that it would be impossible to do non-invasive electrophysiology. So without volume conduction, we could not do electrophysiology experiments. So we need volume conduction. We should be grateful that the universe has volume conduction. On the other hand, volume conduction is a potential source of artifact. It's definitely a concern and a potential artifact for connectivity analyses. And the reason why is that, imagine each of these corresponds to an electrode, or it can also be an MEG sensor, that part doesn't matter. So these are the measurement sensors that we are recording electrical activity from the brain from. And now imagine there's a single source in the brain. That source is going to project to all of the electrodes, or many of the electrodes. And this is Again, this is good, this is volume conduction. This is what allows us to interpret topographical maps and make sense of the topographical activity. However, this poses a challenge for connectivity analyses. And that is because what you want to do in the connectivity analysis or the way that these synchronization analyses work is you compute synchronization between, for example, these two electrodes. And so what you want to infer from the data is that when you see synchronization between these two electrodes, what that actually reflects is neural connectivity between this population of neurons and this distinct population of neurons. This is what you want. This is the ideal situation. And this is possible. This can happen. But there is another possibility that it could be a single source that's projecting simultaneously to both of these electrodes. And therefore, these two electrodes are measuring the same thing. So the synchronization between these two electrodes is going to be artificial. It's going to be spurious. It will be inflated because this is not really synchronization. This is just reflecting the fact that both electrodes here are measuring the same source. Now, in the next video, I'm going to talk more about this issue of volume conduction and what are some different ways that you can go about to uh, either avoid the, having to worry about this potential confound of volume conduction or do some inspection, qualitative and quantitative inspection of the results to, to determine, to test whether your synchronization between these two electrodes actually reflects this situation or this situation. So stay tuned for the next video. Now I want to talk about the idea of connectivity over time versus connectivity over trials. And essentially, there are two different ways. When you have a task-related design, there are two different ways of estimating synchronization or computing, quantifying synchronization. You can compute synchronization over time. That will give you one estimate of synchronization over a block of, you know, let's say one second or two seconds. You measure the synchronization between two electrodes over a period of two seconds. This would be synchronization over time. And another method of quantifying the synchronization is at the same time point over different trials. So this gives you better temporal resolution. You have more precise information about when the synchronization is occurring, but you're looking at average synchronization over the span of many trials. Maybe there's 100 trials. Okay, if this distinction between connectivity over time versus connectivity over trials isn't totally clear, then don't worry, there's going to be a whole video just about this topic later on in this section. So I will unpack this much more. The final point I want to mention here is about the directionality of connectivity. So in the brain, there is a lot of causal interactions, sometimes called directional connectivity or effective connectivity. And that's depicted here by this one-way arrow. So there is information that's flowing from this brain region to this brain region, and something happening here causes some kind of change in activity that's happening over here. So there is a unidirectional causal flow of information from here to here. So in the brain, this sort of causal connection is happening a lot. But in our data analyses, we very often apply symmetric measures of connectivity, which are also called acausal and also sometimes called functional connectivity.
So when you are analyzing the data using symmetric or a-causal measures, then you cannot determine which region is causing activity to change in another region. In fact, you can't even determine whether there is a causal region at all. This would be like a correlation coefficient. That's an example of a symmetric measure of synchronization. So if you correlate variable A with variable B, there's no inherent directionality in the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient between A and B is the same as the correlation coefficient between B and A. So in this section, I'm mostly going to be talking about symmetric measures of connectivity where it is not possible to infer a measure of causality or directionality. I will also be introducing some causal measures like Granger causality, for example, which allows you to measure the directionality and separate the, the causal flow from you know A to B versus B back to A. But in the literature, by and large, most people use non-directional or symmetric a-causal measures of connectivity. And there is a good reason for that. Symmetric measures of synchronization tend to be more statistically robust. They tend to be more well-behaved, therefore more robust to noise. They tend to be easier to work with, and they also tend to be easier to interpret because when you're working with causal or directional measures, you basically have twice the number of sets of results to interpret. So every time you have a pair of electrodes, you always have to consider the direction in this way and or the, the information exchange in this direction and the information exchange in this direction. Now, this discussion is similar to what I discussed with the bivariate versus multivariate interactions in the sense that in the brain, there is tons of directional causal flow happening and in our analyses, we tend to use symmetric or a-causal measures. As I mentioned, there are good reasons for that. It's not a confound. It's not a problem. It's not a real limitation to use symmetric measures of synchronization. But it is important to keep in mind that when you are applying these non-causal measures of synchronization, that you cannot infer the directionality. Now, one of the reasons why causal measures of connectivity are difficult, or I should say why causality is difficult to establish in such a ludicrously complex information processing structure or system like the brain is depicted here. So these are showing two different problems for inferring a causality in brain connectivity measures. So let's say you are measuring region A and you measure region B and you're not measuring region C. So these are your two electrodes here. Let's say, you know, this is uh, some two electrodes over the cortex and C is, you know, some region in the thalamus. It's a nucleus in the thalamus. It's deep inside the brain and you cannot directly measure the activity here because let's say we're working with humans and so, you know, you can't just go around poking uh, electrodes into people's brains. Okay, so let's say you find that there is a correlation between region A and region B, and there's a lag of 20 milliseconds. Now, based on, you know, a naive approach would be, would be to say that it's reasonable to assume that A is causing B, because when you see what happens in A, then 20 milliseconds later, you see correlated activity happening in B. Now, that seems reasonable to infer based on the data. But what you don't know, because you cannot measure region C, is that region C is actually projecting both to region A and to region B, and it projects to region A causally faster, and it projects to region B causally, but it takes a little bit longer. Maybe B is further away, for example. And in fact, it could be in this imaginary network that this connection from C to A and C to B perfectly explains the uh, relationship between A and B. So in fact, it turns out that A and B are really not correlated at all. There is no actual interaction, in information exchange between region A and region B. It's totally spurious, and it's because of region C, which we are not measuring. So this highlights one problem of inferring causality based on a lagged correlation in a complex system where we can't measure everything. The second problem is, you know, even if A and B are reciprocally connected, let's say they are connected and they are synchronized in an oscillatory or rhythmic fashion. So how do you know 
who comes first, who is driving who. Is A driving B with a lag of 10 milliseconds or is B driving A with a lag of 56 milliseconds? So which direction does the causal flow go in? Th like this from, from A to B or like this from B to A and it's taking longer. Now, with symmetric measures of connectivity like correlation or phase lag, it's simply impossible to make this inference with any confidence. So therefore, when applying symmetric or non-causal synchronization measures, we, we basically just forget about inferring any kind of causality and restrict ourselves to inferring causality only when we apply very specific measures that are designed for directional connectivity and Granger causality is one example of an analysis that I'm going to show in this section of the course. Okay, so with that as a brief introduction, I'm now going to move on and in the next video, I'm going to talk more about this issue of volume conduction and what to do about it.